So Jacob uh, Koshi grew up in Singapore, and he had one goal in mind, and that was to be a success in life and to gain a lot of money. But sadly, that led him into the world of booze and drugs and gambling. And in 1980, uh, Jacob was arrested and placed in a rehab prison in Singapore. <clears throat> and all of his goals, all of his ambitions, all of his dreams were locked up with him in that six by 12 foot cell. <clears throat> his heart grew cold, hard, and empty. <clears throat> and Jacob was a smoker, and cigarettes were banned in the jail. So he smuggled in tobacco and rolled it with the pages of a Gideon Bible. And one day while smoking, he fell asleep, and when he woke up, he f found the cigarette had burned out, and all that remained was a scrap of charred paper. And so he unrolled it and read the passage that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So Jacob was intrigued, and so he asked for a new Bible, and then he read the whole story of the conversion of Saul. And he thought to himself, if God can help someone like Saul, God can also help me. And so there in his cell, he knelt and, and prayed and asked the Lord Jesus into his life and to change him. And that's exactly what the Lord did. The Lord indeed transformed his life. And Jacob started to share his story with other inmates. And as soon as he was released from jail, he got involved in a local Baptist church. He met a Christian woman and married her. And in fact, he is now serving the Lord in East Asia. And he's telling people there that he tells people there that who would have believed that I could find the truth by smoking the word of God? And so the passage uh, before us today, though, highlights how Satan can ruin a person. In fact, that's what happened <coughs> to this Jacob person before he met the Lord. <clears throat> this passage highlights how Satan can ruin a person. This passage highlights how society relates to such a person and also how the Savior can restore a person. In fact, this whole chapter, chapter 5, deals with three great fears of the human race, the three greatest tragedies of humanity. We see right here in this chapter. The three great fears are Demons, disease, and death. And the chapter starts out, as Eric read for us, that Jesus heals a demonized man, and, and then later on <clears throat> we read about Jesus healing a diseased woman. And then at the end of the chapter we read about Jesus raising a dead child back to life. We will cover those sections later <clears throat> after the Easter season. <clears throat> but today, we will focus on how Jesus healed the demonized man. And we're going to explore how the one who, called the, who calmed the tumultuous storm also calmed a tormented soul. That's what we're going to see. The one who calmed the tempestuous storm also calmed a tormented soul. And so let's go to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5. <clears throat> it says, They came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. And when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And so here the boat trip is over 
The disciples survived the wild sea, but now they face a wild man. And at that time, no Jewish person would venture into this region <clears throat> because it was a place of the dead, as we read about here. It was a cemetery, and it was a home for pigs, both of which are deemed unclean in the Torah. Now, we're not told how this man became demonized, but the passage gives a vivid and a tragic picture of how Satan can destroy a person. In fact, the late theologian J.I. Packard once said, Satan has no constructive purpose of his own. His tactics are simply to thwart God and destroy people. <clears throat> the Talmud, which is a Jewish commentary of the Torah lists four signs of madness. The first is walking about at night. The second is spending the night in a cemetery. The third is tearing one's clothes. And the fourth is destroying what one was given. And this man depicts exactly these things. This list depicts the demonized man before us. <clears throat> Satan robbed him of his home. Satan robbed him of his family. Satan robbed him of his friends. Satan robbed him of his decency, of his sanity, his self-control. He was robbed of peace and purpose for living. At one time, he was a mother's little boy. He may have been a, the husband of a young bride. He may have been the father of little children. And now he is a terror or was a terror to his neighbors. And when we read this passage, it is shameful to see what Satan can do to a person. Satan is fierce, he is vicious, he's always on the prowl seeking to devour vulnerable people. In fact, if we go to 1 Peter chapter 5, <clears throat> there is a passage there that tells us how this evil one works. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That is his modus operandi. And so we saw here how what Satan can do to a man. Let's look at what, how society deals with this man. <clears throat> they tried in verses <clears throat> 3, 4, <clears throat> and 5, it says, and he had his dwelling among the tombs and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by the shackles and broken in pieces. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. And so here we see that society, the way that they dealt with this man is to restrain him, to chain him up to try to keep him from putting others in harm's way. And because of his Herculean strength, he could not be physically bound. No matter how hard they tried, he was able to break through the restraints. He could not be physically bound, but tragically this man was spiritually bound. <clears throat> and the <clears throat> pitiful cries of this poor man reached God's ears and moved his heart to extend mercy. <clears throat> this treacherous boat trip across the Sea of Galilee 
was precisely for this man from the Gerasenes. And so Satan destroyed this man. Society could not help this man. And yet we discover that the Savior delivered him. <clears throat> Verses 6 and 7, seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. <clears throat> and so demons may have power over people, but these verses prove that Jesus has power over demons. And it appears that this demonized man was drawn to Jesus. He ran to him. <clears throat> and Jesus saw below the surface, below the screams, below the scars, Jesus saw a desperate man. And that's why he crossed the stormy sea so that he might set this man free. If we go to 1 John chapter 3, it tells us what Jesus' mission is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And that's why Jesus went to the shore crossing that stormy sea was to destroy the works of the devil in this man. Now even demons discern Jesus' divine nature. The statement made by the unclean spirits here answers the question that the disciples had in chapter 4, verse 41, which we looked at last week. The disciples said, when Jesus stilled the storm, they said, who then is this man? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Well, that answers, that question is answered by the demons. They declared he is the son of the most high God. Not only do demons believe Jesus is the son of God, they also believe in a future judgment. They know their final fate. And I believe Satan's goal is to deceive people into thinking there is no future judgment after death. But they know, the demons know that there's a, a judgment that awaits them, but they seek to deceive us into thinking that there is no judgment, but... Hebrews 9, verse 27 tells us this. And inasmuch as it is appointed and inasmuch as it is appointed for man to die once, and after this comes judgment. And so there is a future judgment. And the future judgment of demons is to be confined to the abyss. This is why they say. I implore you by God, do not torment me. Do not send me into the abyss. See, if we go to other accounts, in the, the, the same account in other Gospels, we get a little more detail about what is exactly going on. And so if we go to Luke chapter 8, which also describes the same account, Verse 31, it says, they were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. That's their future fate. And that's what they were hoping to avoid. So what's an abyss? Think of an, think of an abyss as a jail cell. It is a place of confinement. And to be cast into the abyss means that these unclean spirits could no longer exert their unholy influence over people. That's why they exist. They exist to destroy. And so they didn't want to be confined, just like this Jacob guy didn't want to be confined in a six by 12 foot cell. And so that's why they are pleading with the Lord not to send them into the abyss. There is an appointed time, however, 
for demons to be confined into the abyss, but that time has not yet come. Likely the time for them to be thrown into the abyss is when the Lord Jesus returns and sets up his messianic reign for a thousand years. And so in verse 7 and 8, uh, verse 7 and 10, it says, For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore them, implore him earnestly not to send them out into the country. Now, some church leaders claim that demon possession is not a mental disorder. Now, in saying that, it obviously causes psychological problems, but that's not the cause. It's not caused by an imbalance of neurotransmitters in our brain. Of course, brain chemistry can be thrown out of whack because of demon possession, but out of whack brain chemistry is not the cause of demon possession. So then the question is, what is the cause of demon possession? Well, we've likely heard the term squatters. A squatter is anyone who lives in a home they do not own and have no permission to occupy. That's what a squatter is. They're illegitimately possessing a home or dwelling in a home. And that's kind of how these, that's kind of how demons work. They're like squatters. They invade, they intrude, they occupy a person's soul and they need to be evicted from that person's life. In fact, this man had thousands of squatter demons in his life. The reason why we say this is because the term legion refers to 6,000 Roman soldiers. So a demon is a soldier of Satan. And thousands of Satan's soldiers raided this man's life, occupied his soul. And notice the command, come out, in verse 8. Jesus had been saying to him, come out. That is the eviction notice. Jesus did not invoke rituals. He didn't invoke symbols. He didn't recite formulas to evict these demons. It was by the power and authority of God that Jesus was able to order the demons to come out of this man. <clears throat> and it appears that in the unseen realm, in the spiritual realm, Satan has an ordered structure, an ordered governmental structure, which may include demons having charge over geographical regions. For example, when he said, when the demons implored Jesus, do not, not to send them out of the country. Well, what's that about? Why not be set out, sent out of the country? Well, Daniel, in the book of Daniel, there's a reference to the princes of Persia and Greece. And it appears that these princes are demonic beings ruling over the regions of Persia and Greece. Let's go to Daniel chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 12. Here Daniel is having a conversation with an angel. He's having a vision of the end of days. Verse 12, then he, the angel, said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel. From the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, who is also an angel, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of, per with the kings of Persia. 
And then if we jump down to verse 20, again, the angel said to Daniel, do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia, for I am going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. And so it appears that these princes are demonic beings who rule over the region of Persia and Greece. They have a geographic location. And so that could be why these demons were saying, do not send us out of the region, because that was the geographic location that they were assigned in Satan's ordered governmental structure. And so this legion of demons had three fears. One, they feared being confined to the abyss. This is why they say, do not torment me. They didn't want to be confined to the abyss. They fear being cast out of their chosen region. This is why they said, do not send us out of the country. And the third thing they feared was being disembodied. You see, the whole reason, the whole modus operandi, if I could say that, of the demonic realm is to destroy. So they want to inhabit. They want to occupy. They want to indwell living beings so they might exert their harmful influence. So I hope from this passage we recognize and we would agree that demons are real. They are powerful. They are destructive. But praise be to God, they can be conquered by the Lord Jesus. Verse 11, Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. So here are these unclean spirits went into unclean swine. And the fact that they went into these pigs is proof, physical, tangible proof, that the dem demons left the man. And what demons did to these pigs, they seek to do to people. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, referring to the evil one, says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's all they do. They do nothing constructive, only destructive. But then Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Again, that's why he came, to destroy the works of the, de of the devil and to give us new life. And so this man must have had a very strong will to resist killing himself because as we see, these pigs could not withstand the lethal power of demons. The swine preferred death over demon possession. Now, the late <clears throat> atheist T.H. Huxley was reading this passage and he commented on it, and this is what he said. Everything I know about law and justice convinces me that the wanton destruction of other people's property is a misdemeanor of evil example. In other words, he read this passage, he saw the destruction, read about the destruction of 2,000 pigs, and he blamed Jesus for the crime of wiping out someone's large herd of pigs. Now it's worthy to note here that Jesus did not destroy the pigs. The demons did. And besides what Huxley failed to take into account is that the salvation of one person is worth more than 2,000 pigs. <clears throat> and so the one who calmed the tumultuous storm has now calmed the tormented 
soul. In verses 14 and 17, it says, The herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed in his right mind, the very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore him to leave their region. Good news travels fast, and so news about this healing quickly spread. And when the townspeople arrived, what did they notice? Well, they noticed a man not roving around in a wild craze, but sitting in his right mind. They noticed a man who sat calm and clothed as a new creation in Christ Jesus. And what a shocking response from the people. They implored Jesus to leave their region. And I think this response highlights an important principle. The principle is this, miracles do not always draw out faith in people. Miracles do not always draw out faith in people. In fact, when we read in the book of Exodus or in the Torah, we see that Israel, when they were in the desert for 40 years, God was always providing for them in miraculous ways. And yet with respect to that generation, the Lord calls them an unbelieving generation. They were an unbelieving generation who saw the signs. The signs did not elicit faith. We see this as well with the Pharisees. Jesus performing miracle after miracle and the Pharisees are saying he's doing this because he has a demon. Signs and wonders do not elicit faith. Scripture teaches that faith comes by hearing, not by seeing. In Romans 10 it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. It is the message of the gospel that draws out a faith response in people. This is why it's so important for us to be sharing the gospel. <clears throat> now why the lack of faith among the people in the region? Well, it appears that they craved money more than the Messiah. Rather than rejoice in the healing of this man that sat there in his with sound mind, rather than rejoice in the healing, they mourned the loss of their prophets. You know, it reminds me of a poem I read a few days ago. It goes like this. Rabbi, be gone. Thy powers bring loss to us and ours. Our ways are not as thine. Thou lovest men, we love swine. O get ye hence, omnipotence, and take this fool of thine, his soul. What care we for his soul? What good to us that thou hast made him whole, since we have lost our swine? It's an interesting poem, showing that they don't care about this man's life and that he's restored. All they care about is their livestock. And so the passage here shows how Satan can ruin a person. It shows how society relates to such a person. And it shows how the Savior can restore such a person. And in verses 18, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had the demon possessed the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. You see, the Lord Jesus does not stay where he is not wanted. He doesn't force himself on anyone. And yet, what an opportunity these people missed. The town people 
may have begged Jesus to leave, but the healed man begged to be with Jesus. In fact, that's when he called his disciples. He called them to be with him. And this is the proper desire for any disciple of the Lord, to be with Jesus. But I want you to notice there's three prayers in this passage. <clears throat> the first prayer is the demons implored Jesus to go into the swine, and their request was granted. The second prayer is the townspeople implored Jesus to leave their region and their response or their prayer was also granted. And here we have the healed man and he implored Jesus to go with him. And surprisingly, Jesus denied his request. Can you imagine his first prayer as a new man in Christ was a no? And this teaches us that sometimes the Lord denies our prayers because he has something better for us. It's no because there's a greater plan. And here it is in verse 19 and 20, and he did not let him but he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things the Lord Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. So he had a mission. The Lord gave him a mission. He denied him his request, but he gave him even a better plan. And so the people of the <clears throat> Gerasenes may not want Jesus in their midst, but the Lord loved them and would not leave the region without leaving a witness behind. They didn't want Jesus in their midst, but Jesus left someone behind as a witness. And so here this man who had been a terror to many was now given testimony to many. And so although the Lord denied his request, this healed man embraced his new mission. And notice where Jesus sends the healed man. He sends him back to his home, back to his family. His family likely suffered much grief over his tragic state. And they probably gave up all hope that he would ever be made well. Now, now they will have the pleasure of seeing him as a new man. Now he can be the husband and father he was meant to be. In fact, this man was likely the first missionary to the Gentiles. And the reason why we say that is because Decapolis was a Gentile region. And notice when he went out and shared the great things the Lord had done for him, notice the response to his testimony. Everyone was amazed. In fact, this healed man paved the way for Jesus to minister there later. They kicked him out of the region, say, go away. But this man that was left behind paved the way for Jesus to minister later. And, and I say that because if you go to chapter 7 of Mark, <clears throat> verses 31 to the end, let me just read those verses. Again, he went out. Jesus went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. So here Jesus is back in this region. And they brought to him, the people of Decapolis, the very ones that were telling him to leave, they brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hand on him. And Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue with his saliva and looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, well, I can't pronounce that word, but it means be opened. 
and his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was removed and he began speaking plainly. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, he has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. These very people of Decapolis were the ones that were asking Jesus to leave the territory. And now because of the testimony of this healed man, they were open at a later time for the ministry that Jesus had. So in closing, what great things has the Lord done for you today? Are you willing to share your story with others? Have you made your salvation public? There's a passage in Psalm 107. Let the redeemed tell their story. Will we tell our story to others? Our testimony needs to begin in our own home and in our own neighborhood. Before we go across the seas to bear witness for the Lord Jesus, we need to be faithful to tell what great things the Lord has done for us in our own homes and in our own neighborhoods. Why don't we pray? Lord, we thank you for the great things that you do in our lives. Every day you are doing something in us. And as it says in that Psalm 107, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We who are redeemed, Lord, open our mouths that we might share with family members or with um, relatives or with neighbors or our colleagues at work or wherever we might be that we might share the great things the Lord has done in our lives. Open our eyes, Lord, to see you at work and then open our mouths to share it because indeed you are great. And thank you, Lord, for all the work that you have been doing in our lives, all the work you've done over the years, all the work you're doing now, today, in the work that you continue to do even until you return. You are a great God. Thank you that you have shown mercy to us like you've shown mercy to this demonized man and healing him, restoring him. And Lord, if there's anyone among us or listening online who is struggling with some affliction, Lord, may you speak in to their lives and set them free. You are a God who sets the captives free. And Lord, as you set this man free from the things that bound him, may you set us free from the things that bind us as well. And if there's anyone in here or listening online and does not know you in personal relationship, then Lord, may you draw them to yourself. May you bring them to a place of repentance. May you bring them to a place where they seek your face and call on you for salvation. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.